really don't know where to start. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, since we graduated from high school, we were uh, uh, had to uh, uh, register, and you could usually figure 30 days and you're in the service. But uh, uh, Dad had pretty poor health. My brother was a little bit too young yet, so they gave me a year uh, agricultural deferment. So I was uh, 19 when I first went to the service. First started in uh, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, hot part of the summer, and uh, was going to have to go on a 25-mile hike and uh, be sweating a lot. So they said that we should uh, take a little extra salt, so they gave us some extra salt pills. So I thought, well, I'll just drop them in my coffee and, and uh, do it that way. Don't do it. it <laughs> I was so doggone sick, I couldn't hardly stand, but too darn bullheaded to get it in the meat wagon. But that was a long, long hike. And uh, and we went to uh, uh, Florida for our advanced training. Uh, did most of that in the uh, B-24, the flying box car. You uh, uh, stick your gun out the window and shoot at the uh, target that was about a thousand feet long, pulled by another plane. And uh, <clears throat> of course, everything was. Uh, uh, all had tracer bullets, that then we could tell who was hitting and who wasn't. And as far ahead as that plane was, a lot of times he'd come home with a couple bullet holes in the tail. Just a lot of gunnery practice. Always shot uh, 50 caliber. And <clears throat> so they uh, gave us shotguns, which had very similar pattern and everything, and not near the range. And <clears throat> first time I. Uh, Shot, shotgun, I got one bird and nicked one. But I think the most fun on our uh, target uh, practice, <clears throat> we'd have a old racetrack and they mounted a uh, shotgun on a uh, shock absorber. And we went around the racetrack at about 30, 40 miles an hour. And uh, they had skeet houses uh, all the way around and we had to, uh, uh, as we went by, why they'd shoot out a pigeon, we were supposed to shoot it. And it uh, simulated air-to-air -air, uh, practice. That was fun, but uh, if you get nine or ten, you use a pretty doggone good shot. <laughs> I was a gunner. Uh, the B-29, that was the, the time one of the most marvelous airplanes they made. <laughs> it was the first airplane that had a computer on it. And our guns were all computer operated. Uh, <clears throat> we would just have a, a little pedestal and we would uh, frame with a light, imposed light, on an incoming plane. And of course, the closer it came, why the larger you would have to make the, uh, the circle. And it sent that information to the computer and the computer uh, corrected for ballistics, airspeed, and uh, distance and all that kind of stuff. But the only problem was, it was kind of slow. Uh, they would be, uh, they said that they was uh, a tenth of a second slow. Well, the biggest part of our training was to learn to uh, track smooth and uh, uh, have a smooth circle. If you didn't, why, that commuter was just going like that, trying to catch up with you and uh, <laughs> couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. But if you uh, got real smooth on it, that thing was deadly. The thing that we had to worry about most was anti-aircraft. See, we were flying at uh, average of, uh, oh, between uh, uh, 285 and 350, and uh, at uh, about average 32,000 feet. Well, by the time they uh, got us aimed and uh, fired off, why, it was several minutes before that bullet could get up to us. So we continually moved, changed our airspeed, uh, uh, altitude, and direction. And there's a couple times that they had us pretty well 
uh, zeroed in on, and there was some of these air, anti aircraft uh, bombs. It's kind of like these firecrackers, you know, and they shoot up in the air and then they explode. And uh, <clears throat> there was close enough a couple of times that they rocked the plane. But there was long flights, you know. It was, uh, oh, 12, 14 hours uh, round trip. So I always took a, a bunch of sandwiches along or something. And we would always have a good cheese sandwich in there. So if some of this flak would, would penetrate the aircraft, uh, the uh, pressurized cabins, or we'd just put a little bit of cheese over there and maintain our air pressure. We was in uh, Elmer Garter, it was supposed to have been for uh, three months, and about two months, why they had a little over two months, two and a half months, why they kicked us out, and we went to Topeka for a staging area. Uh, then he had to go home then, and I was ready to go overseas. And we waited there for the biggest part of a month, and we couldn't figure out what the heck the problem was. It was in such a hurry to get us out of a gunnery, advanced gunnery, and uh, <clears throat> still he'd sit there, and we could sit there twiddling our thumbs for a month waiting to go overseas. And it wasn't until after the war was over that we found that, uh, that we uh, uh, was retrofitting the B-29 for the atom bomb. Uh, see, the B-29 had two bomb bays uh, separated, and uh, they had to cut the middle section out because the atom bomb was too big for one, t uh, one uh, uh, bay. <clears throat> and also, the pilots had to learn how to fly again because they had to drop the bomb and get out before the blast caught up with them. So they had to learn to make a 90-degree turn with a B-29 uh, so they could get the heck out of there before the bomb got them too. When they uh, had dropped the bomb, we was in Saipan and made a couple of missions and we was in, uh, so uh, <clears throat> we kind of torched it for them. We uh, put down a whole bunch of uh, incendiaries and on the way home, why well, we had heard that uh, they dropped a big bomb north of us and we weren't very impressive. We dropped a whole bunch of little bombs and we weren't until home until we uh, got back to Saipan that we realized that that was the first atomic bomb. And uh, <clears throat> it wasn't uh, very long then, a couple of days when they dropped the second one and then the war was over. The uh, Japanese had been uh, in war with the Chinese for, I guess, years before then. Their PW, prisoner of war uh, camps, way inland on China because they didn't have enough uh, room on, on the island. And uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, our, our boys were just starving to death because they didn't have enough food for their own people. They sure as heck weren't going to give any to the PWs. So it was our job. We flew five PW missions to all the different camps that they had in there. And <clears throat> we parachuted pallets of supplies to them. We had to fly just a few miles above uh, uh, stalling speed at about 200 feet and try and drop them in parachutes uh, and hit the, in the middle of the stockade. And uh, uh, once in a while, one of those parachutes would get caught in the bomb bay and somebody had to get down there and cut it out. And that was probably more dangerous than, than the uh, flying missions were. Uh, on the way home, I guess, uh, I think I covered about everything until we got home. Uh, we uh, landed in uh, uh, L.A. and then we took a bus up to Seattle, which was our uh, uh, debarkation point. That's supposed to be the most beautiful drive that you can make. We did it at night. <laughs> got, uh, got our discharge papers and uh, then we were citizens. We were on our own. We had to get home. and. Uh, <clears throat> Wouldn't you know that the railroads were on strike? The buses were either on strike or fully loaded. The airplanes were booked up for two weeks ahead. So uh, Buddy and I decided, well, well, we'd never done it before. We'd try hitchhiking. So we picked up a, a XGI that was coming from California. And uh, he was driving. Uh, one of these Ford V8s, uh, I think it was a 33 model, 
They were the only touring car that they made with a cloth top in them. They had a section, a square section of cloth top, and it come down, was coming down the uh, hill, uh, it's kind of washboardy. And wouldn't you know, that thing went, the car went crossways and started rolling down the hill and uh, threw me through the top. And it was straight up on one side and straight down on the other. And I got in a fetal position as I was rolling down and I uh, could see a, a bush. So I made a grab for that and it broke my fall enough so that all it did was just kind of bang me up a little bit. And it wasn't for, uh, about a day or so, I guess, where the trains uh, 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 settled their strike and we got trained and the rest of the way home. So I'd been in the service for a couple of years, never had a scratch on, and wasn't out for two days and darn near got killed. <laughs> <laughs> got her back home. <laughs> Get civilianized again, and then I got a job for the railroad. Livingston was the biggest repair shop between uh, uh, St. Paul and uh, Aurora, Washington, and, uh, and worked for the railroad for about seven and a half years then. And I just got out of my time as a journeyman machinist. And uh, 30 days, they had a big layoff. And they laid off uh, half of the force. Well, of course, that caught me. So it just happened that that fall, this ranch next to Dad's was, uh, we always kind of had an eye on that. So I bought the place. And uh, it was unquestionably the most rundown place in the valley. I'm telling you, you cannot imagine how run down that was. And when I bought the place where the guys at the roundhouse, I, <laughs> they had bets going, I wouldn't stay out there a, a, a year. Uh, kind of fool them, still there. <laughs> and they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed flying. I think I've got over $500 in service. And then uh, we used to fly quite a lot when we was on our vacations. And, uh, rent a car, so love to fly. <laughs>